Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We're in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Now last week we did a comparison with another chapter of Scripture. Who remembers what it is? It was an easy one to remember. Somebody. Revelation, Revelation chapter 15. 15. That's right, because the Song of Moses which is found here in Exodus 15, is again mentioned in Revelation chapter 15, the Song of Moses. And it's going to be sung at the end of time, just like it's sung here at the beginning of Israel becoming a nation. The point that marks Israel as a nation is not when they're the, the people in slavery in Egypt, but as they cross the Red Sea, at that point they are formed by God into a nation. And here they are crossing the Red Sea. They are formed by God into a nation. There is a sound of rejoicing. The old bondage of Egypt is broken, and they are on their way to the promised land. Is that exciting or is that what? But I tell you, looking at that and then comparing it with Revelation, which we'll be doing, the Lord willing, in a week or so, uh, we're going to see some very exciting things. We just read that passage a moment ago, so I'll not read it again. But you remember that the crossing of the sea was the second greatest physical miracle in the Old Testament after creation. In preparation for looking at the Song of Moses, we closed on January 1st, that's three weeks ago, by looking at a very exciting rare word in chapter 15, a word that's found in that Song of Moses when uh, Moses and the children of Israel with an antiphonal response from Miriam and the women with her where it says with the blast of thy nostrils the waters were gathered together the flood stood upright as in heap and the depths were congealed that's our word congealed in the heart of the sea we saw that that word is a rare word it's also used though in Job where it is translated curdled me like cheese so the water didn't freeze it curdled like cheese you stop and think about that. Have you never seen water that's curdled like cheese? Well, you can put stuff into it like with jello, but you can't just curdle it in its current state. And that's what God did. That introduced us to chapter 15, which is where we are today. So I hope you have your Bibles open so that we can be looking through that as we go through the text today. Now, last week we began looking at the important Old, St Old Testament song by noting that music plays a very key role in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. We talked about how many songs are recorded. We talked about bad music being mentioned, such as the music used at the worship of Baal, and we'll, we'll talk more about Baal music uh, later on, the Lord willing. And then we talk about the good music, too, in contrast. So how do you know the difference between what God calls good music and what God calls bad music? You know, there is this mindless drivel that rolls around in Christian circles today uh, that calls itself Christian music. And there's the theory that, well, just as long as the words are okay, it doesn't matter what kind of music uh, is attached to the words. That's nonsense, and the Bible says so, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but that is the current position of most neo-evangelicals uh, who have their wiggling bodies, strobe lights, and rock bands uh, yelling and screaming into microphones up on the stage of their platforms as the, the lights go dark. Listen, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. I mean, that's not the kind of thing that glorifies God, and that's not praise and worship, where everybody goes into a trance and begins to wave their hands and sway back and forth and move into the charismatic type of element. Uh, you're, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, <laughs> bad music. We'll talk about, uh, <laughs> Lord willing, passages of Scripture that describe that kind of music for us. Uh, the entire book of Psalms, of course, is good music because that was uh, the ancient musical hymnal for ancient Israel. And there are various markers in the Psalms that talk about the type of instruments to be used in accompanying the Psalms, the type of singing that is supposed to be done, whether or not it is antiphonal or not, whether or not that music was to be sung uh, as a solo line or in part harmony. Did you know that there are all kinds of musical notations in the Psalms that give us a lot of information about what music is supposed to be like? We'll be talking about that later. Different groups of people are mentioned singing. Different groups of people are, uh, different individuals are mentioned as singing. And I, I just said in passing last week, the Bible mentions that God himself sings. Let me read you that verse. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Now we know that. He created everything. He spoke a word. And you think about all of the universes that sprang into existence. Is God mighty? I only hear an amen. amen. Okay. The Lord God is mighty. 
the very fact that he is the creator of all that exists, and you can look through even these gigantic telescopes they have, and you do not see the edge of the universe. All he had to do was speak, and it went out and became. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. Is that true? Yes. He's a God of redemption. That's what we're looking at here in our text. He's redeeming Israel. He's forming a new people. He's making a covenant with them. An eternal covenant, by the way, not a temporary covenant. Not a replacement theology covenant. He's making a covenant with Israel, with the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, that's true about us being saved from death to life, darkness to light, yes. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. That makes me weep. Why would God be happy about me? Why would he be happy about you? A lot of times I as a pastor not happy about you. How can God be happy about you? <laughs> but I'm just as bad and I know it. And yet it says, He will rejoice over thee with joy. Think of a mother with her newborn baby. Think about the joy as she holds it in her arms. Think about the joy of a wedding. Think of the marriage feast of the Lamb. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. His love is not an agitated love. His love is at rest. It's at peace. This is God. Now look at the last phrase. It tells us how he's going to rejoice over us. He will joy over thee with singing. Jesus talks about how there is joy in the presence of God when one sinner repents. It doesn't say that there is joy by the angels. It says there is joy in the presence of the angels. Who is the one who is rejoicing in the presence of the angels when somebody comes to Christ? It's God himself. And he will joy over you with singing. Some of you heard the various choirs, some were okay and some were not so okay, that uh, performed at the uh, swearing-in ceremony of the president a couple of days ago. You've heard great choirs, you've heard great orchestras, You've heard great music. Can you imagine what it is like when God himself sings? Every choir, every orchestra, every symphony, every composed piece of music wilts when God sings. God is a musical being and he made man to be a musical being because music is part of his character and of his nature and when we are fully transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ we will reflect all those things that are glorious that bring him glory that's music from God himself and music is indeed his gift to mankind I mentioned also last week, and now I want to look at a little deeper, the Bible also tells us that the devil is a musical being. Did you know that? In Ezekiel, the devil is called the king of Tyre. Now, earlier in the chapter, if you look at the first part of uh, the chapter, in chapter 28, you begin to see that the prince of Tyre is talked about, and he's clearly a human being, as it's described in the first 11 verses. And God is placing a curse on the prince of Tyre. But when we get to verse 12, it's clear that we're talking about Satan. Follow along with me, if you will, in Ezekiel chapter 28. Because here we find some things about Satan's musical capacity. Ezekiel chapter 28. I'll wait for you to get there. Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 12. Now here we have him, the Son of Man, that's Ezekiel, which is a title that our Lord Jesus Christ took for himself, you recall. He calls himself Son of Man more frequently than any other title that he calls himself 
in the Gospels. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king, not the prince. The prince was back in verse 1. Upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now the prince of Tyre, who lived in 570 BC or so when Ezekiel's writing, uh, the prince of Tyre never lived in the Garden of Eden, and neither did the king of Tyre, the human one. But whoever we're talking about here has been in the Garden of Eden. Now, as I look back at Genesis, besides God himself, I only find Adam and Eve and the serpent. Thou hast been in Eden in the Garden of God. Every precious stone was like covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. Remember it said he summed up beauty? He was the epitome of beauty, the capstone of beauty, the most beautiful creature that God ever made. Now look at the next phrase, because this is our key phrase. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So we have a created being here. We don't have a, a representation of God. We have a created being. And then it tells us who he is. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set thee so, Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You know right away you are not talking about a human king of Tyre. You're talking about the king of Tyre who's the real king of Tyre. That nation that was in rebellion against God. The one who was behind the prince of Tyre. The one who motivated the throne. The one who caused all wickedness and the curses to come against Tyre. The one who had his seat there in Tyre at that time, though he has moved it. We find that in Revelation. It's Satan. He's called the anointed cherub that covereth. Where do you see the cherubim in the Old Testament? see them in several places. First of all, you see them represented in the two cherubs that covered the Ark of the Covenant. You remember, that was the gold box inside the Holy of Holies where there was the tablets of the law a pot of manna, and Rose, uh, Aaron's rod that budded. And on top of that was a gold plate, and the cherubs hovered their wings over the top of that, these gold cherubs, and it was upon that which was called the mercy seat, that once a year on Yom Kippur, Leviticus chapters 16 and 17, once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat between the cherubim, and it was there that the Shekinah glory of God rested showing his presence with Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. And Jesus is called our mercy seat. The Greek word is hilasterion. He's our mercy seat, and upon him was his blood shed on his very own body, and he was surrounded by the holy angels. The mercy seat, the cherubim, the angelic beings closest to the heart of God and closest to the throne of God. There are also the seraphim. We see those in Isaiah chapter 6. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands, millions, billions perhaps, of seraphim, the burning ones. But the cherubim, seraphim means the burning ones. Cherubim means the covering ones. The ones that cover the mercy seat. That tells you what an incredible position of honor Satan had from the beginning. And he was the most important one. He was the sum of beauty. When you looked at him, he was full of wisdom. He was perfect as he was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Satan, and we'll 
study that, not this week, but Lord willing in the next few weeks in Isaiah chapter 14. Because another musical term about Satan is found in Isaiah 14, which des describes his five great I wills and describes him being cast out of heaven. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. He got started looking at himself instead of looking at God. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that Behold thee, all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. God speaking his judgment against Satan. But remember those two musical words that were used of him. The first word that we see there is tabrets. That's the Hebrew word tof, a tambourine or a timbrel. That's an instrument for producing what? Well, what kind of music? Rhythm and beat. That's the part of the music that deals with rhythm and beat. The tabret. That's the part that produces the rhythm, the beat. We see tambourines being used by Miriam and the women who sing the Song of Moses. That doesn't make it bad. The question is, how is it being used? We see, for example, the first uh, time that that occurs is in Genesis 31. Uh, I'm not going to read you all the verses today, but I'll give you at least one illustration of that. Genesis 31, beginning in verse 26. And here we have Jacob is running away with uh, his two wives, and uh, you know their father is chasing after him because Jacob is tired of working for this guy. He's worked for him for 20 years, and he keeps getting ripped off, and he keeps getting cheated, and he keeps getting things twisted around. So uh, now he's running away, and Laban is caught up with him with a whole gang of armed guys. And Laban said unto Jacob, What hast thou done that thou hast stolen away and awares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Well, hey man, they were his wives, you know. I mean, you gave them to him. He's lived with them for 20 years. So now, what are you doing chasing him? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me that I might send thee away with mirth? Well, look, you know, <laughs> Laban wouldn't have done that. <laughs> He would try to figure out some other way to keep Jacob because Jacob was the guy that made stuff work. I would have something with mirth and with songs, with tabret and with harp. That's the very first time we find tabrets mentioned in the scripture. And thou hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters, but I hast now done foolishly in so doing. Now, we'll talk more about that later, the Lord willing. The second word here that we find is the word pipes. Now, that is also a musical word, and I'm going to save that one for next week because I want to move on to the next one. Another musical word that's used of Satan in Isaiah 14 is viols. Verse 11 of chapter 14 in Isaiah. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy viols. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Now, I was doing a word study on this one, and this is really fascinating. That's why I'm skipping pipes because I wanted to make sure we got to viols. Um, the word is nebel. That's the word that almost always is translated as a skin bottle, the kind of thing that you hold water or wine or something like that in. A skin bottle. But in 27 cases, it refers to a musical instrument in the Old Testament. 23 of the times it's translated sultry, and four times it's translated as viol. That was a stringed instrument <coughs> with longer strings than a lyre. Now, harps also have longer strings than a lyre, but different word is used to describe harps and lyres. You see, harps and lyres were plucked. Boing, 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 you know, so like your guitar, you know, or a harp that we have today, the big orchestral harp. That's the way that the harps and lyres were played, by plucking them. But apparently, a viol had a bow that was drawn across it like a violin or a viola. <laughs> Our English word, violin, and by viola, come from that same English word, viol, which is what the King James translators used to translate it because they knew they were dealing with a different instrument, an instrument that was played by crossing the strings. You know, you've got your bass viol. That's a 
big huge thing that a guy sits up there on the stage you can stand up to play it and then you've got your uh, violins and you've got your violas and you've got your cellos you know those are all the stringed instruments but they're played by drawing a bow across the strings rather interesting also that the word nebel appears to be related to the word in fact it is from the same primary root related to the word nabal or nabal as we would say in english that's the word for a fool both come from the primary root nabel meaning to fall away to fail to faint to be foolish or to be stupid or when used in a moral context to be wicked or disgraceful you remember the husband of Abigail who became David's wife in 1 Samuel chapter 25 and 26 was named Nabal because he was a wicked fool. You remember uh, David and his men had been protecting Nabal's flocks so that nobody would steal from them and then at the end of that season David sent a messenger saying you know we, uh, we'd like to get paid for the work that we've done protecting your flocks and Nabal said you know what do I have to do with David he's an outlaw uh, I don't have to have give him anything and uh, so that king got back to David and David you know got really mad and he said you know we, we've sweated bullets so <laughs> he didn't actually say that but I mean this is similar to that you know we've worked for this guy all winter long and he's not even gonna pay us and so he and his armed men were gonna go down and kill Nabal and uh, Abigail heard that it was happening she got on a donkey packed up a whole bunch of stuff food and met David and his men as they were heading down to kill Nabal and uh, she gave it to him and said my husband Nabal is as his name says he's a fool that's the same root from which we get this a viol can produce both melody and harmony when more than one string is bowed at a time you know usually you're hearing just one string as it plays a melody but you know you can play harmony you can play two in some cases three strings as you rock the bow across the the instrument and so you can produce harmonic sounds as well as melodic sounds. The implications from this word are that the musical instruments built into Satan could produce rhythm, melody, and harmony. Those are the three basic elements of music. It's clear from Ezekiel 28 that these musical instruments are actually built into Satan's spiritual body because that's what it says in the text that they were created in him in the day that he was created association with the skin bottle which is where that word usually is translated like a skin you know a wine bottle or a water bottle or something uh, association with that as the word is frequently used perhaps refers to the wind source moving across the strings similar to the human vocal cords you know that's what you get when you sing you are allowing the controlled movement of air across your vocal cords as you sing to produce the sound <laughs> that's a controlled sound produced by moving the air out of the bag of the lungs across the vocal cords in any case multiple springs strings are involved in the instrument so multiple notes could be produced at once when we look at Satan here ironically when God inspired the scriptures he used the same primary root to describe the instrument that was built into Satan so he perhaps can even sing in harmony but God used that same word to describe a wicked fool we also see that word showing up in the book of Amos for example Amos chapter 5 verse 23 take thou away from me the noise of thy songs for I will not hear the melody of thy viols music was also commanded in the Old Testament God commanded certain groups of people with special and distinct qualifications to participate in worship first in the tabernacle later in the temple we talked about all the different kinds of songs that are actually written out for us in detail in the Bible Bible songs before going into battle victory songs ascent to Jerusalem Keith mentioned that this morning when we were reading Psalm 122 that was one of the songs of ascent as the pilgrims went up to Jerusalem for the major feast days there are songs that are written to curse the enemies of God songs of worship and praise lo love songs like Song of Solomon many different types of music mentioned in the New Testament divided into three categories that are appropriate for the church Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs now the reason I stopped for that 
little quick overview of Satan, and we'll do more of that, the Lord willing, uh, when we come back next week. But the reason I stopped to do that and to mention that fact is because the Bible has a lot to say about music, and Satan is always trying to corrupt the worship of God and direct music to himself. And he is a musical being. After God, he is the second most musical being in all of the universe. Do you not think that he will try to take and use it for his glory instead of for God's glory? And stupid Christians don't get that. They just think, well, it really doesn't matter as long as it makes me feel good. Listen, that's not the test of good music. Whether it makes you feel good or not is irrelevant. The question is, does it follow biblical principles? And it's not just a matter of the words. Because God not only gave us his word, he gave us song. And people sang in the Bible, and it glorified God, and some of it did not, and God cursed it. We need to understand that God cares about music as well as about the words that are attached to the music. One of the principal ways in which God has commanded the worship of himself is with music, so we can expect, obviously, a direct attack in the area of music in the church. We also need to remember that music was central to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, I read to you part of our brochure last week about how we consistently and constantly seek to maintain a robust, though traditional form of worship and music consistent with our heritage stemming from the Protestant Reformation. Because the Protestant Reformation brought, brought us back to the Bible and back to the biblical principles of music. And nobody understands that today. We remember all the great doctrines of the faith that they preach, but we forget that they also had a great interest in music and what kind of music would glorify God. And yes, I know that people say, well, but remember Martin Luther took drinking songs. Well, there's one song that they think he took from drinking songs. Luther was a musician. He was a very good musician, too, by the way. We'll talk about that later. Well, what about those kinds of instances? And is that really an excuse for doing wrong? You see another Christian. Let's, let's assume Martin Luther sinned at that point. Let's just assume it. It's not true, but let's assume it. And so we say, okay, Martin Luther sinned. So that's okay for me to sin too. Because Martin Luther did it, I can do it. Is that right? No. What is your test? What is your ultimate standard? We honor the men of the Reformation, but what is our ultimate standard? Our ultimate standard is not people. Our ultimate standard is the Word of God. That's the final authority. We need to remember that as we discuss this. So we talked a little bit about Luther, we talked about Calvin developing a philosophy of church music, we talked about Johann Sebastian Bach, who really understood the principles, and magnificent George Frederick Handel, the Messiah, we talked about the Psalter of Isaac Watts, we talked about how even the Arminians were using the principles of music developed by the Reformation, such as John Wesley's hymn book. Uh, you know, we, we talked about how Rome hates L Luther. One of the reasons, and they even made declarations to this effect back in the 20th century, papal pronouncements based on their opposition to Luther and the Reformation in relation to music. The Catholic Church doesn't like the Reformation music, though some Catholic churches have absorbed that, but more of them have absorbed the charismatic stuff. You've got all kinds of charismatic Catholics out there, and the Pope doesn't mind that, because that is drawing all sorts of different people together into a big compact, very fuzzy compact, which will ultimately be under his authority and eventually under the authority of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Folks, I tell you, music is going to be one of the tools that Satan uses to build the one world church. And we need to understand that from the get-go. Music, and we talk about Jews singing hymns too based on the Old Testament musical portions, some of which we'll be looking at. And even the Jews have absorbed some of the Reformation developments of music. So music and the worship of God. Key battleground in the church today. Vicious battle. Satan has made fearsome advances in this area against the so-called evangelical churches of our day who have begun to compromise on musical doctrines, on doctrines of separation, on inspiration and preservation, on creationism. You find that that kind of music goes along with those who deny those key doctrines of scripture. Why is it important? Because music makes a huge impact on the body and on the emotions. Music affects your body. Did you know that? When you begin to feel certain beats, it can actually change your heart rate. 
I'll be talking about scientific evidence for that later on. But when you are in the presence of certain loud beats, it actually changes your heart rate even if you try to control it. It changes certain ways in which the brain waves go through your mind. Did you know, know that certain forms of rock music can actually cause plants to wilt? Scientific studies have been done that. You got the plant there. You put the speaker next to the plant. You play classical music toward it. You know what it does? It leans toward the speaker. It doesn't just lean toward the light. It leans toward the speaker. You put the rock music over the speaker and the plant not only leans away, but it begins to wilt and die. You know, and, and evangelicals, the evangelicals, charismatics, they, they, they think, oh, this is okay for our young people. This is okay for our young people. People, it affects your body. And it affects your emotions. You listen to that all day long? It's doing things to you inside that you don't even recognize it's happening. You say, but I'm not even listening to it. It's still doing things to you that scramble you mentally and emotionally and will drag you down morally. It's very, very, very dangerous. Well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to establish some biblical foundations first. I've told you a few of the conclusions. I've given you a couple of illustrations. The Lord willing, we'll look at that. The Lord willing, later on. So if music is not fully under the control of the Holy Spirit, working in the regenerated human spirit of those who are saved, it becomes a tool of the devil and a vessel for dragging believers into the most abominable forms of moral decadence and depravity while they stu stupidly think they're worshiping God. No, they're not worshiping God. There are demons there dancing with them. That should waken us to the seriousness of music in the Bible. Then we read that magnificent passage out of Revelation 15. I'll just read you the one verse again. Verse 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now we're going to talk about the song of the Lamb later because that relates to the church in contrast to the song of Moses, which relates to Israel, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So we saw already the crossing of the Red Sea was designed to strike fear and awe into the hearts of all the rest of the world, and it says so there in Exodus 13 that everybody would hear about that. Just like Pharaoh's troops, the people of the earth will know that God is the one behind the plagues of Revelation. They still refuse to repent. We talked about repentance last week. Oh, dear people, there is sin in the church. I mean, I'm not just talking about the church at large. Everybody knows that. Sin in this church, sin that needs to be repented of. People who need to make things right with God. In many different areas. Not just in the area of music, though that's obviously one of them. That's what we're talking about. Because if repentance doesn't come, God is long-suffering. That is, putting up with difficult people. Patience is putting up with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. He's long-suffering toward us, where that is to us, believers, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Believers are called to repentance, not just unbelievers. When we have sin in our life, we need to repent of it. We need to confess it as sin. We need to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. We need to walk forward and have our consciences cleansed too. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, all that junk of the past, to serve the living God. God cleanses your conscience for the purpose of service. But men will not repent during the plagues of Revelation 16. And we saw that the same thing in Revelation 2 and Revelation 9. So, last week I ended by asking you a question. Why? The question I asked was why? Why would they refuse to repent when they can see the power and judgment of God and know that God is doing it? You know, Paul explains in Romans chapter 1 that all men are held accountable because it says, from creation, it says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal what? What's the word? Power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So now here in Revelation, they are seeing it. 
They're seeing his eternal power and Godhead. And they're without excuse when they refuse to repent because it says they blasphemed the name of the, God, of the God of heaven who has power over these plagues and they refuse to repent. Some of you have a hard heart and you're refusing to repent. So I ask the question, why would they refuse to repent when they see the power and judgment of God and know that God is doing it? And they know that they cannot beat him. I gave you a passage to read. How many of you read 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 14 in preparation for today? Please raise your hand. Three. Folks, how can you learn on Sunday if you don't do your homework? I give you something because it's for your good. I don't ask you to do this a lot. I don't ask you to read 17 chapters in 24 hours. I ask you to read one passage. You need to repent. You need to start focusing on the Word of God. Well, I'll read it to you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You're not kidding. And it's working in the church, and Paul's writing to a church. Only he who now letteth will let. You say, what in the world does that mean? Until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed and it's a wicked one, it's personal, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So Paul is talking eschatologically. Paul is talking about the things that we see in the book of Revelation where we see the judgments of God being poured out on the earth in Revelation 16 that we've just been talking about. So here is a key theological explanation for why the people respond the way they do. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. we got the false prophet and the Antichrist in view and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now let me pause on that verse for a minute. That's verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Satan's been producing power and signs and lying wonders. You know, next Sunday evening is our fifth Sunday special. And we're going to look at the signs and wonders movement exposed. You're going to see video footage of what goes on in some of these incredibly bizarre so-called services. And how it is contrary to the word of God and how it is empowered by demons. Do you understand that this is one of Satan's key ways of working even in churches? He has what? He's able to do signs. He's got powers. He's got signs. He's got lying wonders. Without the word lying, those three words are words that are used in the miracles of Jesus Christ. Satan can counterfeit them. You remember the magicians of Egypt, Janus and Jambres? They could counterfeit a whole bunch of the miracles that Moses did. Satan has powers and signs and lying wonders, those are all things that are used for the purpose of deception. Because it says so in verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. He's trying to keep them lost. He's trying to keep them on their way to hell and they think they're doing okay. And look at the key phrase, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He's going to use that phrase again down in verse 12. But I want you to see why the people of Revelation do not repent. Look at verse 11. And for this cause, that is because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For that cause, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God himself is going to judge them by saying, okay, you want to believe a lie? I'll make sure you do. That's why they don't repent in the book of Revelation. They know it's God. They know who he is. They know his power. They can see it. Paul said so back in the book of Romans, and it's certainly true during the book of Revelation. But you'd think that when they see that much power and know that it's the God of heaven, that at least that would jar them awake and make them repent. 
but they don't because they received not the love of the truth and for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness you see they were enjoying themselves did you see that's parallel with verse 10 this is, talks about the pleasure in verse 10 you know they didn't have the love of the truth the unrighteousness is in verse 10 they didn't want to be saved why because they were having fun you know what part of its music too we'll see that when we get the book of Revelation but I'm not gonna I don't want to preach that sermon yet <laughs> uh, that's part of what keeps them bound in their pleasure seeking their pleasure palaces their sex and drugs and drugs are mentioned quite frequently in the book of Revelation as one of the means by which demons enter people that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness you see unrighteousness deceives that's what it says in verse 10 with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish and they had pleasure in unrighteousness so they said if I trust Christ it will change my life and I like my life the way it is and I don't want to change yeah I know it's got some problems but man I am da, 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 I'm having fun booga, 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 booga. wiggle 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 Satan's a musical being and he knows how to use it he understands have you ever stopped to think why do they play certain types of music in different types of restaurants you go to a fast food restaurant and what kind of music they playing bumble 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 they're trying to get you through and out through and out through and out through and out you go to a nice high-class French restaurant where you want a nice ambiance what are they gonna be playing they're gonna play you know Strauss waltzes they'll play Chopin music they'll play the kind of music that lets you relax so that you'll enjoy your food and not have a you know indigestion and bellyache by the time you get out of there the people of the world understand that music does things Christians don't admit it the whole world when you look at a commercial on TV you know you've got certain kind of music in the background you saw all these political commercials that came up and they're playing they're showing red white and blue and they're playing you know patriotic music in the back John Sousa marches or Star Spangled Banner or something like this you see fireworks going on I mean they know that what they're doing is setting the stage because if otherwise you just got a talking head saying my name is blah 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 and I am running for blah blah and I want you to vote for me and I hope you will vote for me because I'm a really cool guy who would vote for him they set the stage with the music and the graphics that's what advertising is all about folks do you know that when you get on an elevator you hear the Muzak you know you go into the dentist's office you hear certain kinds of music you know every place you go somebody's playing music in the background why because they know it is setting you up for what comes next the world understands that but Christians don't have the foggiest I did some part-time teaching at a Bible college that will remain un unmentioned unnamed down in the south and uh, you know I got into this kind of discussion and the mindless way in which the young people and that was what 20 years ago the mindless way in which young people think or don't think about their music and what it is doing to them physically and actually in some cases is breaking down certain cells in their bodies and they don't get it I'm sorry I'm getting ahead of that's not the message I was gonna preach today <laughs> okay let's get back to the text why don't they repent because they refuse the truth because they're having pleasure in unrighteousness in doing the wicked things of earth so the answer is threefold first why they refuse to repent first the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is removed in this passage did you notice that it says he that now letteth will let uh, the word letteth means to restrain so there's a restraining ministry of some kind that's going to be removed I think it's the Holy Spirit I know for sure it's the Holy Spirit because currently the Holy Spirit restrains sin in the world so that men are as not bad as they could be or as they have the potential for being the word letteth means in King James English to restrain people who don't believe in the rapture have tried to suggest that the restrainer is other things you know there are a lot of amillennialists who get to this passion and say what in the world are we going to do with this you know how will we uh, you know wipe this in a way so that we don't have a pre-trib rapture lots of people like to deny this so the people who don't believe in the rapture have tried to suggest that the restrainer is government haha <laughs> that's a joke or the church well you look around you today and that's a joke too 
Or they say, well, it's our conscience. But our conscience has already been defiled. Or uh, the restrainer is international pressures. Those have all been suggested as who is the restrainer here in this verse. Or some other limited sinful power. But only the Holy Spirit can, in reality, keep sin in check so that it doesn't totally destroy the earth. He doesn't remove it, but he restrains it. He only lets it go so far. And then after that, no more. The book of Psalms says, Even the wrath of men shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath thou shalt restrain. So God, even in the context of our current fallen world, restrains wrath for a specific purpose so that ultimately he will be praised because when men rebel against him it enables him to show forth his power and glory and righteousness and judgment on sin and God will reveal all of his character qualities on earth including those that deal with judgment even the wrath of men shall praise thee the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain that's the first reason Currently, the Holy Spirit ministry restrains sin in the world. Second reason, the Antichrist, supernaturally empowered by the devil is de uh, to deceive, is present in our text here. He's the one who is deceiving. So that's the second reason they refuse to repent. The third reason, because unregenerate mankind has rejected the truth of God when they heard it, God himself sends them a strong delusion. That, by the way, is a fulfillment of the doctrine of reprobation, where God himself guarantees that they will go to hell. That's the doctrine of reprobation. We don't like to talk about that because it's a very painful thought. But God himself guarantees these people are going to go to hell. In contrast to this, we have one of Paul's strongest statements in the New Testament about the sovereign free will of God in his elective purposes. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, the very next verse, there's the contrast to all those that are being deceived by the devil. In verse 13 he says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and beneath of the truth. What took place first? God's choice of us to salvation. God's choice of us to salvation. And he accomplished it by setting us apart. That's what sanctification is about. You've heard me preach it. I'll not preach it again, but just summarize it quickly. Sanctification means to set something apart for a specific purpose. And then he guarantees that we won't get killed before he reaches that final stage, which is belief of the truth. There's going to come a point where we trust Christ. Did you know that God is the only one in the universe with an absolute free will? You and I have an accountable will, but it is not free because it is limited. For example, what if you willed with all of your heart to create a rose out of nothing? Is it going to happen? No, because your will is not free in this sense because it is not omnipotent. The first thing you lack for a free will is you do not have omnipotence. Or, number two, what if you willed with all of your heart to be instantly on the moon? But you see, your will is not free in this sense because you are not omnipresent. You don't have one of the necessary character qualities for a truly free will. The first is omniscient, uh, omnipotence. The second one is omnipresence. Or what if you willed as hard as you could to be able to read the mind of Russian President Vladimir Putin? I really want to read his mind. I really want to know what he's thinking. Well, you wouldn't understand anyway. It's being Russian. But even if you could read his mind, okay? But you don't have a free will in this. It's not free in this sense because your will is not omniscient. You see, that's why only God can have a totally free will, an absolutely free will, because he is not limited. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. Only a being who is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and eternally existent can have a truly free will that is limited by nothing except the choices that he himself makes. The one who makes all the rules is the one who has a truly free will because he can make the rules. We don't have a free will because we can't make the rules. We can't suspend the rules with a higher law, which God can do. We can't change the rules. Only God can do any of those things. God suspended some of the rules of nature, for example, while Jesus was on earth. Jesus turned water to wine. Jesus walked on water. God can suspend the rules if he wishes to because he makes the rules. But we can't do that. 
We as human beings cannot extend over all of time and space. Only God can do that. He's in the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. That's why nothing escapes his view and his sovereign directing will. The concept of time travel is merely man's yearning, first begun in the Garden of Eden by the serpent, to be like God. You ever thought about that? Remember the, the, the H.G. Wells or Orson Welles, the time machine? H.G. Wells. Uh, the time machine. You know, man wants to be like God. He wants to be able to see everything all at once, back, forward, go places that only God can do. Sometime, according to the book of Revelation, time itself will be no more. Man is morally accountable because God gives him commands and prohibitions and opportunities to obey or disobey. But man's will is also not free for a multitude of other reasons. Man, I can't believe it. I've got a multitude of other reasons here. But we are already 20 minutes past the hour. It's time to close. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will cause us to understand it, to believe it, and to obey it. We're dealing with a lot of very large principles and trying to condense them as we go through this series because they relate to why music is so important and why there is a spiritual war in heaven on the issue of music because God the most musical being in all of the universe is at war with Satan the highest created being with musical skills and gifts even built into his own body and that is one of the tools one of the basic tools that is used constantly and we see it in scripture but we certainly see it as we look around us today where that war is raging because it is a tool that will either bring glory to God or bring glory to the devil so father we pray that you will by your mercy and grace help us to understand and apply the principles that we learn so that Jesus Christ will be glorified in all that we do and say and think and all that we sing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 560, More About Jesus. Let's stand to sing. We'll sing all the verses of 560, 560, More About Jesus. Let's stand to sing.